Okay, um, the last time I jumped a bit, little bit too quickly to our first theorem, um, where we proved the convergence of uh, power counting finite um, integrals. And I wanted to uh, prove such a theorem as quickly as possible, but actually I jumped ahead of ourselves and uh, we skipped some details which are actually important already for that uh, theorem. Uh, and anyway, these details will be important later on. So now we have to add it back and fill in some gaps and we will improve our power counting lemma here. Let me start with some motivation on power counting. So, so far what we did was to look at our semantic polynomial U of a Feynman graph and then we take some um, parameters alpha i in a subgraph gamma and uh, all those alpha i in a subgraph gamma scale with a common factor rho and all the other alphas outside of gamma they are constant. So then we know that the semantic polynomial scales like rho to the number of loops inside of the subgraph gamma times a constant plus higher orders in rho. We prove that by looking at the definition of the semantic polynomial in terms of the spanning trees. And of course, um, the constant here is a constant as a function of rho, but it depends on all the alphas. So it's not equal to zero, but it depends on the alpha i's. And we didn't really think carefully how it depends on the alpha i's. Okay. But the behavior as a function of rho is established. And then we use this uh, theorem in our, uh, this lemma in our theorem, where we replace the alphas by betas, and then we did a simultaneous um, power counting in terms of many, many different variables. And uh, to draw that conclusion, we need actually a few more details. And so let me give you an example. Let's consider a simple function. Let's call it small u just for uh, simplicity. Let's say beta 1 to the power 1 times beta 2 to the power 0 to make it simple times beta 1 plus beta 2. Okay, so this is a simple function. And uh, in our notation, we would now conclude, okay, for a small beta 1, it scales like beta 1 to the power 1 uh, times maybe a constant plus higher orders in beta 1. So it behaves like this with power uh, 1. As a function of beta 2, if beta 2 becomes small, then it goes like beta 2 to the power 0. So in other words, like a constant as a function of beta 2, it uh, stays like a constant plus higher orders in beta 2. So that is all in line with our previous power counting lemma. However, the bad thing about this function is uh, that if beta 1 and beta 2 simultaneously go to 0, we cannot write it like this, beta 1 to the power 1 times beta 2 to the power 0 times a constant plus higher orders in all the betas, where this constant is not equal to 0, but really a constant. Because obviously, uh, this power does not appear with a constant coefficient. So each term in the function u has either higher powers in beta 1 or higher powers in beta 2, but there exists no term in the function which just contains beta 1 and beta 2 to those minimal powers. So it is not possible for this function to say that uh, it is bigger or equal than beta 1 and beta 2 to those powers times some constant. We cannot find the constant for which we can do such an estimate of the function. Because each term which actually exists in the function has higher powers than the minimum ones. And so if something like this appears in our um, theorem, 
then uh, we cannot prove the theorem. So, but here at this level, the function behaves just like our power counting lemma, but uh, the overall behavior is different from what we need. So let us do another example. U equal to alpha 1 square plus alpha 2. Okay, this looks like a semantic polynomial, not quite. Cannot be a semantic polynomial because a semantic polynomial is always homogeneous in all the alphas. Each term has the same powers of alpha overall. So this cannot be a semantic polynomial, but anyway, it is a function of the alphas. And actually, it corresponds to that function over there if we look at those sectors and we say alpha 1 is bigger or equal than alpha 2, and then we would say alpha 1 is equal to beta 1, and alpha 2 is equal to beta 1 times beta 2, introducing such ratio variables. If we do that, then we get here beta 1 square plus beta 1 times beta 2. That is exactly the function we had before. Okay. So it's really the same function. Only uh, this looks like a semantic polynomial, and this looks like the uh, rearrangement in terms of the betas. So what is wrong with this function? This is also bad. And uh, so what happens? So if you look, for example, at this integral, integral d alpha 1, d alpha 2 of this function, and let's do the following, like it might happen in a Feynman diagram. So you have here a semantic polynomial in the denominator to some power, and in the numerator you also have some function of the alphas. So let's do it like this, 2 times alpha 1 divided by u square. Why do I do it like this? Because then it's extremely simple. So this uh, 2 alpha 1 is the derivative of u. So what we actually have here is the derivative with respect to alpha 1 of minus 1 over u. Okay. So it's a simple integral. Of course, we can analytically evaluate the integral. But now, what can you see if you look into power counting? Then you might discuss power counting. So let's only look at the alpha 1 integration down to 0. What would you say about the alpha 1 integration on its own? If we integrate down to 0, then we have to look at the power counting in terms of alpha 1. How does the integrand behave as a function of alpha 1 only? So if alpha 1 becomes small, u goes to a non-vanishing constant, alpha 2. So 1 over u square is, doesn't go to 1 over 0. The numerator goes to 0, so this is, of course, finite power counting wise. Alpha 2 integration on its own. Alpha 2 integration on its own. If alpha 2 becomes small, then still again u goes to a non-vanishing constant. Therefore, 1 over u is regular and the integral is also finite. What happens if you look in our global way, let's say in a two-dimensional alpha integration, both alphas go to zero simultaneously, so we would do something like a superficial degree of divergence. So what is the superficial degree of divergence? So all alphas are now treated uniformly. Then u behaves like the uniform alpha to power one for small alpha. That can be neglected. So one over u is like one over alpha square. Overall, we have something like one over alpha. So we have d2 alpha times 1 over alpha, that is also finite, because it's two alpha integration variables. So if we apply our way of looking at integrals for Feynman diagrams, we would need to look at all subdiagrams and the overall diagram and do superficial power counting for each case. That is what we have done here. So here, all the subdiagrams are power counting finite. But the integral is divergent, and so let us look at this. So the integral is divergent, and uh, we can again 
do a sector decomposition and look exactly into this sector, which reproduces the beta function from above, namely the sector alpha 1 bigger or equal than alpha 2. And in this sector, we have this integral 0 to 1 d alpha 2, and then only alpha 2 to 1 d alpha 1. So then we have implemented the sector, and we can integrate the uh, integrand, which was the derivative with respect to alpha 1 of minus 1 over u. Okay? So therefore, it's of course extremely simple. Integral 0 to 1 d alpha 2. And this integral is simply the function evaluated at 1 and at alpha 2. So what is this? 1 over u evaluated at 1 gives minus 1 over 1 plus alpha 2. And u evaluated at alpha 2. So this is 1 over alpha 2 squared plus alpha 2. And now we have an integral over alpha 2 down to 0 of this integrand. So this is finite. So it's completely regular. But this essentially behaves like 1 over alpha 2. And the integral over alpha 2 of this is divergent. So this integral is really infinite, despite our power counting. So, our examples show that we can define a function u for which this uh, superficial power counting is not enough. So, we can look at all sectors in the way we do it for Feynman diagrams. Each sector behaves in a finite way, but the integral is divergent. If we do such a sector and go to the betas, then in terms of the betas, we see we have a homogeneous prefactor in the betas. But the property of the function is that the lowest order term in the betas does not have a non-vanishing coefficient. All existing terms in the function have actually higher powers in betas than the lowest one. Now, what we need to prove is that both of these issues can never appear for our semantic polynomials. That is what we need to prove. And uh, that doesn't directly follow from this alone. We need more details. What we need, we need more details about this constant here, which is the remainder uh, after we factor out this powers of rho. So we need to know in more detail what this actually is. And that is what we have to uh, fill in right now. It's not actually difficult, but um, the last time I actually didn't want to spend the time on doing it and wanted to jump to the theorem, but uh, that was actually too quick. Okay, therefore let us go one uh, level uh, more in detail. So let us start with our semantic polynomial in the same way as before. So we have rho times alpha i uh, in gamma and uh, the alpha i outside of gamma, very uh, loose notation. So what is actually um, the semantic polynomial really? Um, what we really have is the sum over all spanning trees of our graph G. Let's call it spanning trees capital T of our graph G. And then for each spanning tree, we take the lines I, um, well, let's say J, outside of the tree and multiply the appropriate alphas which are outside the respective spanning tree. Now, we 
Um, I have now a specific choice of the alphas, namely some alphas are scaled with rho and some other alphas are, are not scaled with rho. So what do we get for each spanning tree? Sum overall spanning tree is T, then the sum overall uh, product overall lines outside of the tree. So we get these uh, reference values, alpha j0, and then we get a certain number of powers of rho. How many powers of rho do we get? We get as many powers of rho as there are lines inside our subgraph, but outside of the tree. Number of lines. Um, in the subgraph, but outside the tree. That means in gamma without or minus the tree. Okay. So this is what we know for sure. And then the minimum number of powers of rho is obtained if we have the uh, minimum number of lines outside of the tree. That means the maximum number of lines in uh, the intersection of gamma and the tree. So that is what we need to focus on, the maximum number of lines in the intersection between uh, the subgraph and any spanning tree. So for this, yeah, let us write down some examples. some usual examples, let's say, take once, for example, this subgraph and uh, once that subgraph here. And now you sum over all possible spanning trees, so you imagine any spanning tree and you ask how many lines are in the intersection between your spanning tree and the red subgraph. So here we can take as a spanning tree the white stuff outside of the subgraph. Then we have no line in the intersection. Or we can take a, um, a spanning tree which intersects the subgraph and then the maximum is that we have one line in the intersection here. And as we said, at least one line of the subgraph must be outside any tree because the subgraph has one loop. So it cannot be that all lines are in the tree. At least one line must be outside. Okay, so if you um, scan over all possible spanning trees of the full graph, then how does it look like inside of the um, smaller graph? So for example, take this spanning tree here. This does nothing inside of gamma. Take that spanning tree here. Then what is this actually if you look from the point of view of the subgraph gamma? So you have now here a part of your spanning tree inside the subgraph gamma. So what is this from the point of view of gamma? The white line is a spanning tree inside the subgraph, right? Here as well, so if you look at some spanning trees, so here for example, this spanning tree has a intersection with the subgraph here, but this is not a spanning tree because uh, that line also belongs to the subgraph and um, it would be part of a spanning tree. But if you take that spanning tree of the full graph, then this has a complete overlap with the subgraph and of course it forms also a spanning tree in the subgraph. So what is special about those big trees which also are a spanning tree inside the subgraph? Those are exactly the trees which maximize the number of lines in the intersection, clearly. There can never be more lines in the intersection than if you have a spanning tree in the intersection. So the intersection must be a tree. And if it's a maximal tree, we get the maximum number of lines in the intersection. So the interesting uh, trees for us are those ones for which the intersection between the big tree and the small subgraph 
is again a spanning tree inside of the subgraph. And here you see the examples. So this is a spanning tree inside the subgraph. This is a spanning tree inside the subgraph. And then we get the um, maximum number of lines in the overlap, and therefore the minimum number of rows. So how should we write this down? So every every T decomposes into a part in gamma. And the part in gamma may be empty. So we had some spanning trees which have no overlap at all with the subgraph. For example, this one here has no overlap. But it may also a spanning tree. So this is basically the worst case and this is the best case. So it decomposes into a part in gamma and a part in the remainder, which is the graph uh, where the subgraph is shrunk to a point. Now, what happens if I take these different trees and uh, shrink the subgraph to a point? So for example, if you take, let me now draw it in some color, for example blue, If you take this tree, which is a spanning tree of the full graph, and it has no intersection with the subgraph, now you shrink the subgraph to a point. Then what does the blue tree become? It becomes a loop, because this is shrunk to a point. Therefore, the blue thing will become a loop. So this part in the reduced graph may be a loop. But let's consider now another spanning tree. Let's consider this spanning tree that I had before. So this is a spanning tree which itself is a spanning tree in the subgraph. If I now shrink the subgraph to a point, then this spanning tree remains a tree because that line is still not part of it. And uh, it may also be a spanning tree of the reduced graph. And now the point is exactly if uh, the tree generates a spanning tree in the subgraph, it also generates a spanning tree in the reduced remaining graph. And that is quite obvious. Let us uh, prove it. So take a tree which generates a spanning tree in the subgraph gamma. So the meaning is that we have the maximum number of lines in the intersection, gamma intersection with T. And uh, that means the minimum power of rho. Okay. So these are the interesting terms for us, which give us uh, the minimum power for which we wanted to know the coefficient. So take such a tree. Such a tree definitely exists because we just have to start with a spanning tree of the subgraph and uh, make it maximal. Then we get definitely at least one or several spanning trees of the full graph. So that exists. And uh, if we take such a tree, then this is also or generates a spanning tree. in the reduced graph G divided by gamma. Not a loop.
So what we need to prove is only that it is a tree, because it, it, by a construction it is of course maximal, it cannot be extended, but uh, it might be a loop. And so we need to prove that it is not a loop. And uh, so we only prove one direction, the other direction is obvious. So let us look at the number of loops in uh, the tree where we contract the subgraph to a point. So let's directly compute this. This is the number of loops in the tree where we have reduced the subgraph to a point. So generally, the number of loops is by, given by the topological formula, number of lines minus number of vertices, uh, often plus one, but here plus the number of connected components of the graph. So this uh, capital C stands for the number of connected components. This is, as usual, the number of lines, the number of vertices, and the number of connected components. Each uh, defined with respect to the graph T, the spanning tree, where we shrink the subgraph gamma to a point. Now what are these individual quantities? So what is, for example, the number of lines I in the tree where we shrink the subgraph gamma to a point? This is, of course, given by the number of lines in the tree, first of all, minus the number of lines in the intersection. Because each line in the intersection is now uh, shrunk to a point. Therefore, it goes away. What is the number of vertices? The number of vertices in uh, such a graph where we shrink part of it to a point. First, we have the number of vertices in the full graph, in the full tree. Then, every vertex in the intersection is shrunk to a point. So, they are subtracted. But then, uh, we get back as many vertices uh, as we have connected components. So, right, if you shrink a subgraph to a point, uh, then each connected component of the subgraph becomes just one vertex. And then the number of connected components is the number of connected components of the spanning tree to begin with. So now we can calculate all of these individual quantities. So maybe first some comments. What do we know about the number of vertices in the intersection? By definition, we started with a spanning tree in the intersection. So this is a spanning tree. Therefore, the number of vertices in the intersection is the same as the number of vertices in the full subgraph because a spanning tree contains all vertices of a graph. Spanning tree contains all vertices, therefore this is equal to that. Similarly here, since uh, it is a spanning tree, the number of connected components is equal to the number of connected components of the full subgraph, since every vertex is reached. So in that we can now make use of. So in this, these two relationships would be different if we took another tree which is, doesn't generate a spanning tree in the subgraph. But now since we have that, we can go on in our calculation and uh, the way I ordered it makes it hopefully obvious because here we simply have the number of loops in our tree. This is the same formula but applied to the tree itself. Number of internal lines minus vertices plus connected components but for the tree, so this is zero. So this is the number of loops in the tree, which is zero. And in the second line, we have the number of loops in our intersection, which is also zero. So we have proven that if we take such a spanning tree, 
then um, it generates also a spanning tree in the reduced graph. And it goes in both directions, so you can easily convince yourself that you have an equivalence. And uh, that means if we take a sum over all spanning trees, T of our full graph, we can decompose the sum in the following way. We uh, take all trees, which are spanning trees, in the subgraph, and they go along with spanning trees in the reduced graph, plus some remaining trees And all the remaining trees, which do not form spanning trees in the subgraph, have uh, more powers of rho. So the minimum power of rho comes exactly from those trees, which can be decomposed into two spanning trees of the different parts of the graph. This is the additional detail, and uh, from this we can now write down a formula for our semantic polynomial. Okay, so the direct consequence of this is if we take our decomposition semantic polynomial, we are all lines inside of gamma are scaled with rho, and all the other lines outside of gamma are kept constant. Then this can be written according to this uh, decomposition of the sum as a sum of two objects, and the first object becomes a product of two semantic polynomials, namely we have the semantic polynomial of the reduced graph, which only depends on the lines outside of the subgraph gamma, so it only depends on alpha i to the power zero times the semantic polynomial for the subgraph with the corresponding alphas times rho to the number of loops in the subgraph plus a remainder, and the remainder contains more powers of rho. And so the additional information we have gained is the coefficient in front of the row to the minimum power. So the coefficient is a product of two distinct semantic polynomials, one for the subgraph and one for the reduced graph. That is the additional information, and now we can use it to derive a corollary for what happens if we look into the betas instead of the alphas. So we can do this quickly. So if we look at a semantic polynomial where we write all the alphas in terms of betas, let's say beta i square up to beta 1 square, comma, beta i square. So the uh, last alpha is directly written as beta i square. The previous alpha is a product of two betas and so on, and the first alpha is a product of all betas. Then what happens? So we can now go step by step. We take out one beta at a time. And uh, then the first step is each alpha now is proportional um, directly to beta i square. And the semantic polynomial is homogeneous in all the alphas. That means the variable beta i square appears exactly to one well-defined power, namely beta i square to the number of loops in the graph. There is no additional term, so this is uh, completely clear. We can factor it out of the semantic polynomial, and then what remains is only the dependence on the remaining alpha. So here, beta i minus 1 square up to beta 1 square, comma, and so on. Then in the 
next to last variable, we have beta i minus 1 square. And in the last variable, we have now a 1, because we have factored out beta i square. So this is simply the overall homogeneity of the semantic polynomial. So for this, we have not yet used um, any power counting. But now we can apply the power counting lemma on this semantic polynomial, which has here a 1. And we can apply it to the subgraph, which separates the 1 from the remainder. So we apply the lemma. on the subgraph, which consists of the full graph minus the last line. Then we get beta i to the power 2 times Lg times. Then from this directly, we obtain semantic polynomial for the subgraph, which is the full graph minus uh, the line times the reduced graph. And the reduced graph is the graph where we shrink every line except for the last one to a point. That means the reduced graph is just the graph where the line i makes a loop. So this is the semantic polynomial for this graph where everything is a point except for the line number i. This is a graph with exactly one line and exactly one loop and exactly one semantic, uh, one uh, Schwinger parameter alpha. And this Schwinger parameter is set to unity here. Times the semantic polynomial for the subgraph, g minus this, which depends on all the other betas. Beta i minus 1 square times and so on up to beta 1 square up to beta i minus 1 square. And actually, I've not even factored out the beta i minus 1. Because that is not even necessary. But we know we have plus higher powers in uh, beta i minus 1 square. Two higher powers uh, than this one. Um, what is it? 2 times L G minus I plus 2. Okay, but now you hopefully see the pattern. What we simply do is we take one line at a time, take it out of the graph, and each time we pick up a product of two semantic polynomials. One semantic polynomial is trivially set to one. So the value of this semantic polynomial is one. And the remaining semantic polynomial, which depends on all the betas. And if we now do this iteratively for all the lines, then in the end, we obtain that uh, for each beta, we obtain the appropriate power. Beta i to the power 2 times Lg times and so on, up to beta 1 to the power 2 times L1, times, now combination of many, many semantic polynomials, but uh, the first semantic polynomial is always 1. So this is now the new information. We get one term which has coefficient 1 plus higher powers. of the betas. So and this is now our improved power counting lemma for the betas. So if we write the semantic polynomial in terms of the betas, as we did in our convergence theorem, then we can indeed factor out the betas. And that is what we also did last time. And uh, last time I wrote, we can factor out the betas, and then we have times a constant. And that was correct. However, we couldn't conclude it from what we knew last time, but we can conclude it now. And actually, that constant is exactly 1. And then we get higher corrections in terms of the betas. But the important thing for the 
convergence proof was that we have now a lower limit on our semantic polynomial, which is simply given by all the products of the betas. So we have a lower limit. Because these higher powers, by the way, also have positive coefficients. Since every term in every semantic polynomial always has a positive coefficient. So we have a power counting and we can use it to uh, have a lower limit on our semantic polynomial. And in the integral, we have one over the semantic polynomial, and then we have an upper limit on the integrand, which we can use for the convergence theorem. Okay, so this is the additional detail I wanted to tell you. Now, this is a good point for a break. I need to switch the batteries.